Good morning. Uh, thank you, sir, for that uh, lecture. Uh, it made that easier. Um, so, you just mentioned that uh, adolescents and youth are different populations. And this is, they are the focus of our topic for today. In April this year, about 31 young people died of HIV. You can imagine what that looks like. Just imagine a classroom of young people who will die by the end of the month. They will be gone. So these are our future doctors, teachers, lawyers, workers, people who will contribute to our country's role, and they are gone. In a year's time, about 400 young people will die. Far fewer who die in an airplane crash, which will get a lot of media coverage, but they die silently. And the parents cannot even talk about what happened to their children. They might say it was a complicated pneumonia or a brain tumor, which I heard about. And I was, as I was preparing this lecture, it just hit me. I got news that somebody I know personally, I know the parents, I grew up with the mom. His picture is in my phone. He's now in ICU backing three infections. And his mom could even mention the word, and she was using complicated pneumonia. So then you got it. And I texted back that I understand what's happening. There's nothing to be ashamed of. Because that was keeping her from getting support from the other family members. And this boy was admitted last March for pneumonia and still a progress to this stage. So I felt that we should go beyond statistics, as mentioned earlier. There are people behind the numbers. And for me, I'd like to look the trends have been uh, established, just to summarize, but really to get understand what goes on in the heads of these adolescents and young people. What makes them so vulnerable? And knowing that, how should we favor our approach so that we are effective? As mentioned already, they constitute about one in three. So of the 36, about 11 are age 15 to 24. The transmission is mainly through sex, MSM, and a bigger jump in terms of bisexual, which have both partners, male and female and 11% of heterosexual sex, and 2% of uh, uh, injecting drugs, and 1% to pregnancy and vertical transmission. Another trend I'd like to mention is that there's actually, although most are men, there's an increasing number of females. And in fact, said, so this is actually, there's an increase by 187%. And among those who are pregnant, 56% are age 15 to 24. Now, why are females here so important? It's because, of course, they are the partners of those who inject drugs who are bisexuals, who are understand, and they will transmit the infection to their babies. Let's get to know a little bit more about our Filipino adolescents and then that kind of just played around with four adjectives, high and low, early and late. And this is data from the Young Adults Fertility and Sexuality Survey, which was done among 20,000 youth in the Philippines. It's a little data that is the best available so far. I hope they are sexually active. So it may not seem too high, but you know, a couple of days ago, it was just 18 percent and it became 22 percent Now it's 32 percent It must be higher now. This was like six years ago. And um, at this time, um, it surveys that they were not only having um, unprotected sex, but also casual sex. So these are hookups. You meet in a party and then you have sex. But there also is an, an emerging trend, the FUBU, you have to say the word, friendly benefits, 
you're not in a relationship that you have regular sex. And already in this survey, 5% uh, had sex uh, with other men. Very low common use. And this was even lower at the last encounter, sexual encounter. And the reasons would be uh, we did not plan to have sex. Uh, my partner doesn't like to have use a condom. Um, we, we get embarrassed if we buy like condoms. It's difficult, it's, it's expensive. So it, um, the condom use is actually very complicated for adolescents. No? It's not only getting it, but negotiating how to use it. That, that is uh, what we need to understand. Um, it has already shown that HIV prevention knowledge is very low. This is a combination of the men and the women. So it's 50%, 20% to its women. I think it's lower for men. Let's go to MSM and transgender. So I hope everybody understands who the transgender women are. So they are born and legal sex is male, but the gender identity is female. And sometimes they transition to the way they look the way they act, uh, use of hormones, and sometimes surgery. So they also constitute a key population here. So this is a study done among uh, MSMs in the Filipino city, and notice that the sexual view is much earlier than the general, in general, huh? youth in general. The first sex was enum, and usually it was receptive. And we should, the study pointed out that it occurred among acquaintances, neighbors, or Barcada, sometimes relatives. And the most common relative has a more even a brother. So there are issues here about abuse you know, and consent. Problem use is just 47% among MSM and even lower among. Transgender. And I was wondering as I was reading the literature, why is this so much lower? Um, there's a population of transgender women who are interviewed in the city, these were uh, sex workers. And why are they in the industry or in, the, in, in doing sex work? Where there's pressure, of course, economic pressure. Also, the pressure to do the transition. That's you know, getting money for the hormones and make the surgery. And so, as a sex worker, you don't have much in terms of choice regarding condom use. Now, one of the things that is emerging actually is the use of social media and apps, dating apps, that new access could be feeding the epidemic. Are you familiar with that? Uh, any apps? Yes? Nobody's <laughs> saying. Grinder. Huh? Grinder. Grinder, yeah, exactly. And Grinder is the number one. There are others, so Scrap, Hornet, Tinder, Jack, but Grinder is the most common one. Commonly used, it's the biggest. Now, what is this? It's a jail social app, meaning it's not only like you're interactive, but you also are looking at using your phone. Also, GPS. So what happens is this is how it looks. Is that if you have the app, you download it from Apple. It's on Android and uh, iPhones. So what comes out here is that you have uh, pictures. And if you take a picture, it will show you the profile as well as the location. For this guy, for instance, is just 463 feet away. So then you may talk to chat or have a date or be a friend or be in a relationship. Okay? So this makes it very easy for our young people to move out. It used to be that it would be very difficult for them to get on a date, to get, to get somebody to see or talk to on a date. But this just a click. One of the guys said, we don't even have to talk. We just click and then we talk and have sex. No talking. And so this puts them really uh, at a very vulnerable position. Number one, uh, aside from the 
the, aside from the uh, possibility of HIV, also STIs are more common because you're actually tapping into a network of people who really have STIs. The other is that this is a stranger you're having sex with, so there have been sexual harassment and violence involved uh, among those who use this. Okay, so the other thing that we need to understand is that, as mentioned earlier, that testing is late, and diagnosis is late, and treatment is late, mainly because of lack of access, stigma, discrimination, or they say, I'm not promiscuous enough. I just had sex with a couple of guys. I don't need to test it. And so we, um, in the end, because of the, the, the late diagnosis, we have very low CD4 counts. Anything that occurred now is 300, the average, very low count. And, and much of uh, but then to be uh, noted is the uh, very poor linkage to care. Okay, now it's even worse for young people. They have the lowest proportion of treatment. For instance, in this particular graph, you see that only 3% of those 15 to 19 year olds get treatment or are on treatment. Only 11 of those 20 to 24 are on treatment. So, really at a disadvantage. What's more is that very low proportion on treatment and they get it quite late. So, 60%, only 6, I'm sorry, only 60% are able to access the treatment within a year. The rest access the treatment one to three years later. By that time, it could be too late. So this is the summary of what's happening to young, our young people. There's ex ex early sexual review, risky behaviors. So now we comprise 30% of the new cases and 56% of the pregnant women. Knowledge is low, common use is low, diagnosis is late, C counts are low, and linkage to care is low. Now, this is the HIV care cascade of the splash, just in another format. But you can see that for adolescents, it's problematic at each point. Getting tested, being into care, staying in care, getting your, uh, getting your medicines, and uh, getting tested again for viral suppression. So all of these are problematic for adolescents. Now, this is the uh, care cascade. This is 2016. And this is for specifically for MSM and transgender women. And so, this peak bar over here represents 46 the estimated people living with HIV. Some of these are MSM uh, transgender women. And we see that only 63% have been diagnosed. Of those diagnosed, only 49% are on ART. This number, 14,000, is actually just one third of those total number of people living. Now, there's testing for viral load only in about one in five. And although 92% uh, achieve viral suppression, you see that there's a huge gap in the number of people that need to be tested for viral load. So where are we normally long off from this dream in terms of this particular issue? Well, we don't talk a little bit about issues and concerns about adolescents. Why are they very vulnerable? And you should understand that adolescence is a very distinct. We can follow how it was for you. Uh, there's a lot of uh, changes going on physical, emotional, psychosocial. We wanted to be autonomous. Uh, we wanted to seek our own identity, experiment sexually, to find our own identity, our own, um, our own place in the world. And what is, and that those behaviors actually they put that to us at risk. We actually try to look for our own identity, fit with our 
peers, we can put ourselves in a very vulnerable position. The thing I'd like to share with you actually is the science of the adolescent brain, which may help us understand why we take this. You know? So initially we thought that the brain would be done to be mature at the time for 16 to 17. Now, uh, imaging has shown us that actually the brain is fully mature mid 20s. So 24 or 25. So a lot of the decisions that our adolescents may be doing is because of this immature work in progress brain. Now, why is why is why is this uh, so? It seems that the development of the brain starts from the back of the brain, where we have the limbic system, and ends in the prefrontal lobe, where we have executive exact, exact function, decision making, judgment. So you may have a mature looking boy guy, but his brain is not quite mature. So, in general, adolescents actually. Because the prefrontal lobe develops fast. It's the limbic system, it's the emotional brain that develops first. Generally, we think that impulse control, judgment, decision making skills, they are here and now. They cannot think of consequences. So they can go ahead and flip and see that guy, but not thinking about consequences later on. And they're prone to peer presence. It's not even pressure. Just a mere presence of, of peers affects their behavior in a negative way and also in a positive way. Other things are going on. We, of course, know that they lack information, they lack services, they have poor classic behaviors because they think they're invisible, invincible. And we have restrictive policies that regulate like HIV testing and contraception. Their stigma is discrimination. We also need to understand that even though they are now connected with peer, adherence is always an issue. Adherence means they continue to take the medicines, they continue to go back and have their examinations. It's, a, it's always a problem. Even among those adults, us, just finishing a course of antibiotics can be difficult. You know? So, adherence is always a, a big issue and it should be addressed. Now, these are the common uh, barriers to adherence. Uh, long distances, uh, discrimination we feel about, uh, feel uh, apprehensive to identify the somebody with HIV. Transport costs, long with very common in the government. And so this is a Okay, so knowing all of that, oh yeah, this is very impulsive. But at the same time, we have not provided them with the tools to make the proper decisions. Uh, the values uh, and all the rest, the, the policies are not supportive of their uh, autonomy. What? How should we approach this? Now, this is that. This is that. This just shows us that. Uh, young people are key in controlling you know, um, the, the epidemic. So we need to increase knowledge of HIV transmission. Uh, we need to prevent new uh, HIV infections. We need to test and we need to eliminate mother to child transmission. Now, we have made some progress. And we were, I was so glad to see uh, Center the age of consent. This must be in the way to be clean. And there is such a thing as mature minors. So they are defined as those who are younger than 15, but who have been pregnant to give birth, who are married, or are engaged in high risk behaviors, which you can do by screening, no? Take a sexuality, a sexual history. So they can give consent on their own if testing is needed. Okay, now again, a body body comprehensive sexuality education, which actually scares a lot of um, the population, the community. 
no? because they, uh, they're afraid that if you give information and services, our adolescents become promiscuous. No? We should always correct the misconception. Giving information and giving services actually delays sexual activity, and if you become sexually active, they're more likely to use contraception. So we should always take a stand when it comes to sexual education. Now, um, I am really optimistic that we definitely will come up with more of this. Finally, after all these years, uh, I hope in our life this will be done. We need it very badly. Yeah. And then, so when people ask you about this, are you just going to talk about sex? No, it's not only information, but we talk about skills, decision making skills, skills that they need to negotiate and navigate their relationships and, of course, values. Now, we also need to talk about making our services adolescent friendly. What's adolescent friendly? It's accessible, it's affordable, it's effective. The services are run by people who have been trained, who do not judge, who keep confidentiality and privacy. You know? And as much as possible, make it one stop shop. Don't ask them to go from one building to the other. As much as possible, integrate all the services in one place. We as adults even have difficulty navigating PGH. Can you imagine asking that young person to look for a clinic somewhere in one of the one of the rooms in the corner of PGH. So we need, we need to make sure that it's easy and it's accessible. And we actually like community-based clinics rather than facility-based. So we need to think about that. We need guidance, uh, guidance and support. Now, of course, we need to empower the adolescents. And this is from this is from the group uh, Link Up. And they, they emphasize that we need to uh, involve the adolescents in the programs. They cannot just be passive recipients, but they have to be involved in the planning and the implementation. As I mentioned, they are influenced by the peers. And so peer educators are quite effective. No? So they listen to the peers. Remember, they're very more open to the peers and to the adults. The activity should be fun, not a lecture like this. There should be music, art, there should be drama, some drama, some art to it. No? And they like to be in groups. And what's emerging now is technology. And uh, this is a statement, but a statement by uh, the executive director of Gates and says the potential of new technologies to energize, re energize the AIDS movement is clear. We need nothing less than an HIV prevention revolution with social media and mobile technology that is born. This is where we are now. Everybody is in social media. And it is a tool. I've shown you the apps, but we can have another app. To give information. And what's good here is that there's emerging scientific evidence that this really works. You know, this is an article uh, in 2017 that states concludes that social media interventions are effective in promoting HIV testing on an MSM in many settings. So we have to take this in mind. You might want to use a handbook that's already available. So it's something that we should have. Okay. Now, back to the clinical uh, aspect of care, we should address adherence. And there are some ways that we can do this by simplifying the regimen or having them take it from the uh, directly observed treatment. So that's thoughts like TB. Uh, the use of adherence support devices, non it's just a beeper or a cell phone to remind. Uh, counseling and education, peer support, attendance in the clinic, uh, providing marriage services as well as peer support, and some even give finan financial incentives. Now, transition to adult care. So, a little straight to you, but eventually these adolescents will be an ARP to survive 
and move on to adult care. Now, the move to adult care may not be very welcome because usually pediatricians are born to read and soft spoken, and the internal men people are more go oriented. And this transfer from pediatric to adult care is very critical because they may drop out because they don't want to go to the adult clinic. So we need to manage the transition carefully and prepare them with the skills to be autonomous and independent and to be able to manage themselves in adult care. Now, um, I'm a pediatrician and I'd like to sh uh, show perhaps who are the pediatricians. Yeah, okay. I just realized we don't even have a policy that addresses HIV. And so I'm learning this from AAP. So maybe it's something that we should think about. And in this uh, in this policy, uh, in this policy, they say that we have a key role, and one of this is creating an atmosphere where they can talk to us. We should also have the skills to do a psychosocial interview and a sexual history, which a lot of educators we find difficult to do. But we should learn this because unless we speak, we will never know. We will not fail unless we ask. And we should do this reduction counseling. We have to talk about hormones. Starting abstinence, but we have to talk about other messages as well. And offering HIV testing and feel that this is really needed. In the States, it's routine, but right now it's we still speak for this and operate for those who are at risk. So in summary, um, these are basically what's happening. In high cases, number of cases, because of early sexual review, low knowledge, low common use, late diagnosis and treatment, low linkage to care. What we want to do is to increase knowledge, access to services, and peer support. We want early testing, diagnosis, and linkage to care. We need to address adherence and transition to adult care. We want to change restrictive laws and norms. Please let's talk about sex and HIV and in pregnancy. It's all over, but nobody wants to talk about it. And of course, low to none stigma and discrimination. This really prevents our adolescents from accessing care and saving them with their lives. So we need to go beyond statistics, our own religious beliefs, our own values. We need to go beyond being just a clinician, somebody who vaccinates children, and talk and be open to something that you might think you are comfortable. Because you need to do this if you really believe that our youth are the hope of our country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for Are there any questions from the audience? Yes. <laughs> I was just wondering, so as a pediatrician, uh, this is something that we um, heard about in many fora. Uh, but again, as you mentioned, it's it's not something that we actually are able to indicate in our countries about the about um, sex, much less talking about HIV as it is. And, um, I was just thinking if you could share some tips about how we could um, improve this aspect of communicating with adolescents. I mean, I'm sure before you became the adolescent subspecialist, you were the general pediatrician and you had the same difficulties. So how how did you uh, develop these skills or maybe what skills did you find were helpful for you to include this finding in your practice? Thanks, Anna, for that difficult question. <laughs> okay, so as pediatricians, uh, what the, the first thing that we need to do is actually to expand our 
our practice in terms of age because we as our we are trained mostly to take care of other pies. And so we're very comfortable. And so what number one, and I think we should be, you know, we're in a position to change the curriculum. I think we should be more of the fear of the adolescent, the older child of the adolescent. But it's only because it's through training that we can gain the confidence, no? But if, if this is not possible yet, as pediatricians, when they're pre teens, six or seven, always try to have a few minutes with an adolescent. So you, you open the communication lines of it. As early as four years old, when I'm doing the booster fertility volume, when I examine the patient, I already point out, okay, this is the private part of your body. Nobody can touch you here, or in the cavities, or in the toilet. And I teach them nobody except perhaps your mom. Perhaps a doctor, but always with the, your mom, your dad in the room. So that, that's that. And then as they enter seven or eight, remember they can develop pubertal changes as early as eight. So start talking about what are the expected changes. So I think we're comfortable doing that. And then um, always urge the mothers to start talking about voice and relationships. Because they have their crushes when they're in preschool or high school. And so continue the dialogue as you as they become older and always reserve that short time with them alone. You know? And then that's when you start asking about crushes and um then the uh, other behaviors like smoking or drinking. So when you start the dialogue early and you establish uh, yeah, confidentiality. You, know, you tell the parent that, okay, because your, your kid is now becoming an adolescent and needs some special time. Conversation is confidential unless I find out something that may affect their um, you know, safety. There's somebody bullying or there, um, there are depressive symptoms. That's when you uh, tell the mom about the crashes and questions about sex can be addressed without the mom in the room. So it's a process. Um, I would suggest that you go to a website, www.kidshelp.org. Uh, it's a very useful, uh, it's a very useful website, kidshelp.org, just like that. And you have information about sex, about mental health, about the diet, for children, for adolescents, for parents, and even for doctors. I give this website because, of course, you can take up all the information that you need to give. So, give them uh, the website they can go to. So, I can also the other thing, Anna, is that we should have an openness and an openness to adolescents. And we, most of the time, see, we have the idea that adolescents are probably the years more difficult. But you know, if you get to talk to them one on one, you will realize it's a really engaging conversation and you will have an impact on this adolescence because perhaps nobody else nobody else has talked to them about this Any more questions? There are none. Thank you, Dr. I would like to ask for the specific uh, age group for a little bit of the age I was at. It's for those who were, who had the HIV. John, I, I don't know. I'm not trying to do that. Uh, perhaps, Marina can do that. Uh, what they usually uh, encounter in the clinics are adolescents who know their status or suspect. Uh, by the way, we are getting adolescents who are coming in for bad, really bad TB, tuberculosis, and so we're testing them for HIV. So in that particular case, it's, it's easy to do the validation, but for uh, those, the babies and all that, uh, I prefer. And I'm glad to learn also how to do that, because it can be a very emotional thing. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, in our practice, so since we are getting more patients, also the platforms. 